Thank you very much. I now call on Deputy Maureen O'Sullivan, who has 20 minutes. Thank you. Uh, thank you, and Minister. Um, first of all, I want to acknowledge that this bill is happening and the work that has gone into it. Um, it's long overdue, and I know that the existing legislation came from another time and it is not adequate for dealing with the, the, the emerging needs and the demands today. And I think it's also very good that animal health and welfare are being taken together. I find that very progressive. And I have to acknowledge that you're the first minister, I think, to take real steps in this government in decades to address fundamental animal welfare issues. I know there have been some other bills, but they've been more specific. Um, so I'm going to start with other aspects that I found positive and progressive before I go on to discuss those areas where I feel it's lacking. And I think the minister knows where I'll be going with that one. I think it's good that the bill is firmly stating the responsibility of owners of animals and that animal welfare just doesn't mean an absence of cruelty, but actually means promoting the welfare of the animal. And it's also positive that the, the notices on the conditions for animals and that the failures to look into those conditions would be an offence. We're looking at the extent of the international trade and the importance of knowing the source of animal products and the area of animal disease for imports, the need for surveillance. And I think that works the other ways, the other ways also for our experts and they're covered. It's positive also about the officers that they can inspect the premises with animals and animal products and take samples. The authorised officers being appointed to enforce animal rights legislation is also positive and I think it shows that you are taking animal rights seriously and that nobody is going to be exempt from punishment for cruel treatment of animals. But I think the notices will only be effective if the fines for breaches are significant enough and, there, and also that there will be further consequences for those who don't comply with them. Good on-the-spot fines and penalties as well, I think is great. And because sometimes that on-the-spot fine can mean more, it can be more significant than going through the whole court process, which can drag things out, and the codes of practice as, as well. Um, you don't expect additional costs from the implementation of the bill because you say there are significant numbers of staff already working in the area. And the hope is that the bill will enable their work to be done in a more comprehensive way and therefore adequate uh, to, what is being, to what is intended. Um, one of the items being considered minor, and I'm not sure I agree with this being minor with a lower fine, is deliberate laying of poison that will endanger protected animals. Um, it's extremely positive relating to people who should not be allowed to have animals in their care, and that anyone found guilty of or convicted of a serious animal welfare offence will be precluded from owning or working with animals in the future, and therefore that persistent offenders will be caught, because we know that um, this doesn't happen at the moment. Um, I'm somewhat ambivalent about the sale of animals to a young person under 16 because I know young people who have been extremely careful of animals and I know that this can continue but it will be under their, their parent or their guardian. You know, we have too many cases, individual cases of the Christmas and the birthday present of the designer dog and then it's abandoned. And I want to acknowledge the work of all the animal sanctuaries and the animal shelters who do this work and, and um, are doing phenomenal work. Um, there are young people and teenagers who are committed to animals and of course I want to acknowledge the way in which dogs are being used, not just for people who are visually impaired but also for children with autism. Very positive on the dog fighting and, the, and because animal baiting is just despicable. Um, I'm not too sure that you can preclude coursing because to me that's animal baiting as well. But I think this whole thing of dog fighting should, and I'm glad you have it in there, that it should be completely done away with. Because people who deliberately breed and train God, dogs to fight to be vicious, it's just reprehensible. Um, it's good that it's going to be illegal to attend a dog fight and repercussions for those involved in attending and in organising. And section 16 also giving emergency powers for authorised officers and vets who encounter animals in distress or suffering injuries requiring immediate destruction on humane grounds. And I happened to be out in Cape Clear when the whale was stranded on Baltimore. And I know the distress for people looking at this, never mind the distress to the whale. So I do think, you know, that that kind of legislation will certainly be beneficial there. Um, when it comes to animal welfare, I have to very much, of course, very firmly and strongly acknowledge the work of the late Tony Gregory, because animal welfare was extremely high on his agenda of issues and his regret that more had not been done in his own lifetime. And in his private members in 1993, he made the point that um, on animal welfare, that we should have the welfare, all legislation on animals should have quote, the welfare of the vulnerable and defenceless in nature's creation. And I do acknowledge the work of the late Noel Brown, 
our previous president, Mary Robinson, and the current president, Michael D. Higgins, who had concerns about animal welfare. Um, just looking through the memorandum, and I just want to quote this, that the minister is providing a legislative basis for the protection of all animals, be they farm animals, sport animals, pets, or otherwise. And it's this or otherwise that I'm, I'm interested in. And in your speech yesterday, you were talking about protected animals being accorded greater protection than animals living in the wild. But you did say that all animals are protected insofar as cruel acts are forbidden. And section 12, um, cruelty is expressly forbidden. Unnecessary suffering, whether caused by direct physical abuse, recklessness or negligence. And I welcome all, all of that. Now, I come to where I feel the legislation is falling down. And my first one deals with badgers. Um, I accept that we don't have 100% free bovine TB and that control measures are necessary. But I do think it could be done in a humane way and not in the most barbaric, gruesome and inhumane way of catching badgers in a snare. I've seen them. They belong to a medieval torture chamber, not in a modern so-called civilized society. There's the cruelty in the trap, and then the badger is caught and is a sitting target for the hunter to shoot him. And of course, another offshoot of that is the young badgers being left to starve. There are no badgers in the Isle of Man, but yet they have bovine TB. Farmers who are against this practice say that other important measures could be used to combat TB, like strict movement controls, thorough cleansing of livestock buildings, good ventilation, and double fencing and all boundaries. And I think there were some measures in England, movement controls, improved cattle testing and biosecurity, which saw a 15% reduction in bovine TB. And there are equal improvements in other countries with no badger killing. Now, um, we had questions about this before with your minister, and um, I, I know the, the replies that you gave. But what I'm asking is about, and I've, well, other figures as well from people, that if you call intensively for four years, there's a net benefit of reducing TB in cattle by 12 to 16 percent. So there's 85 percent of the problem remains. Um, I hope that the legislation could lead to a vaccination strategy instead of this very cruel and barbaric practice. The Irish Wildlife Trust in a letter this week to the Times said that since culling began in Ireland many years ago, 90,000 badgers have killed were killed, but 80,000 of them were healthy. And I think Northern Ireland has an example now of testing badgers in the field so that only those infected with, with the TB are killed. And then I'll come to coursing. And I can read out this coursing cruelty catalogue, and I'm just going to take a couple of them um, from various coursing meetings. Over two days of coursing, 16 hares were hit by dogs, nine pinned, seven dying of their injuries. Another one, um, six hares hit by muzzled dogs on day two of this meeting with six injured and two killed. Ten hares hit over another two days, two killed, two injured and two died overnight. Another one, twelve hit by muzzled dogs, one killed, four injured and one put down because of injuries. Now, an interesting one in County West Me, the ranger described, and this is his report, that there were nine hares hit on day one. Of these, one hare was tossed and rolled on the ground, another was tossed and mauled. Another was mauled on the ground by the two dogs and placed in a wooden box. Another was hit about five times and mauled on the ground by the dogs. In Limerick, 15 hares hit by dogs, and the findings of the post-mortem stated, uh, I presume it was internal injuries rather than muzzles coming off. And the ranger noted, yes, that the muzzles did not come off. So muzzles do not prevent cruelty to the animal. There was another meeting where five hares were hit, it was stated that there was, it was known that there was no vet was present but on call, and yet the vet completed a veterinary report despite not being present. And then at another meeting in County Kerry where 12 hares were hit, three killed, three died of natural causes, one put down because of injuries, and the ranger's report noted, um, I'll just have it here, I'll just be very brief on this, um, that it was because of the weather conditions on that day it was very wet weather, very heavy rain on the Saturday night of the coursing, which made the ground very heavy and soggy, and in turn made it difficult for the hares to run, and it resulted in 12 hares being cut. So I believe the ranger should have called off that meeting because of the condition of the field. The condition resulted in the hares being hit and killed, and made it difficult for them to run. But there's nothing in the licenses about weather conditions. The so-called humane practice of muzzling has not stopped the injuries and the deaths. 
And also, before the actual coursing meeting, we know what goes on. The club members go out collecting hairs. Sometimes they do it outside the bounds of the license. Netting, where the supporters are yelling and shouting, herding the hairs into the net, then into an enclosure, which is again cruel on hairs, as they are solitary creatures. The wild hair is released into a field then, and we know what happens. The blooding practice, and it goes on with hares, with rabbits, and with kittens by people who own greyhounds. And then, before the recess, we were debating another bill, and then I discovered that hares can also be shot. I mean, I don't know what the poor hare ever did in Irish society that is the subject of such cruel treatment. I also want to make the point about greyhounds, because they are also an extremely gentle creature. And they too are being trained, as it were, to go out and, you know, and to hunt and to be something that I think is against their nature. They've also suffered injuries because of the muzzle being on them. And I'm not advocating the muzzle being taken off, but the muzzle was supposed to be humane. It's not. Not for the hare and not for the greyhound. There are thriving greyhound industries in countries which have banned hair coursing. Some other points, um, animals being used in experiments. And these search G experiments cause severe and prolonged pain. So there is a concern about the lack of bioethics input in the transposition process. Now, there have been improvements in breeding, but I think some more is needed on legislation and in the code of practice. Um, looking at the, the bird situation, and I acknowledge the work of Birdwatch Ireland, um, and they will tell us that, that they're vital, wild birds are vital indicators of environmental changes. So monitoring their populations is very important, especially when some species are suffering serious declines. And of course, the breeding curlew is one of those. So there is a need to ensure the protocol for reporting on the species and the numbers hunted, the bag returns. Changes in hunting pressure also need to be monitored and the need to review the listed bird species huntable in open season and the monitoring of the number and the impact of the licenses. Fur farming, and again I've seen evidence on the way in which animals are kept and they're against all laws about animal welfare, even the ones that we had before now. It's in that medieval torture chamber that the, of the badger traps. Um, the review group, I believe, submitted a report some months ago, but this is not being addressed in the, in the bill. So I'm hoping that there's separate legislation being planned here. I know there's employment in the area, but I think it is an area where that employment can be diversified into something else for people who want these, these coats. Feral cats are a problem, there's no doubt about that, not just in the country, but in many urban areas and housing estates, and they're an increasing problem. But again, there is a humane way um, through emergency neutering campaign, and many vets are offering this freely. There are other groups involved in raising awareness on this. And I mean, it's, it's horrific to see animals, the dogs and the cats being dumped. One last week, a cat and three kittens dumped out on Dolly Mount Beach and people trying to, to rescue them. And um, the microchipping of all dogs, I think, would go a long way towards tracing back the owner who has just completely disregarded their responsibility in this matter. There's alarming reports of plans to ship Irish horses to China. Now, we had this already with the greyhounds. And why we would think of exporting our animals, live animals, to a country that has a record in inhumane treatment of animals, I don't understand that. China uh, leave out the human rights abuses, but they are a country steeped in animal abuse. And animal organizations can chronicle the horse abuse, which is part of life in China. They have horse fighting. Um, so there's a need here for legislation here that live Irish animals won't be exported to countries with known records of ill treatment of animals. Um, just on the institutions, um, I think there's a lack of formal regulations for monitoring institutions dealing with animals that receive state funding because I think accountability and transparency are vital in ensuring that animal welfare is adhered to. And this goes for animals in private and state-funded organizations. The level of compliance of animal welfare legislation by institutions, they should be inspected by independent authorized animal welfare officers. And I'm thinking of groups like the Irish, the, the Coursing Club, the Greyhound Club, Horse Racing Ireland. My predecessor, the late Tony Gregory, has had a, a quote about the Coursing Club they are a law unto themselves and not fit to regulate anything involving animal welfare. So the new legislation, I don't think, addresses the lack of oversight of a number of state-funded organisations. And perhaps there is a need for an independent body where people can go if they have complaints of animal welfare standards in those institutions. 
Um, it, at the moment, it's not possible to know the extent of animal cruelty existing or whether all practices with animals are in, are in accordance with the law inside these organizations because there is no transparency. And I'm asking if the new authorized animal welfare officers will have the authority to enter these present premises and monitor animal activity, sport recreation activities and animal experimentation. Now, I know the Arts Council get funding for circuses. And again, the question is just the levels of compliance in circuses to cover animal welfare standards. And I'm asking, does this feature in the applications for Arts Council grants and are inspections currently carried out before the grants are allocated? And again, can the authorised officers have the authority to go into circuses? And I want to acknowledge faucets who have um, eliminated animals from their particular circus, and it's all on the human activities, acrobats and that. I know there's a bit of debate over zoos. Um, I personally think that you know, Dublin Zoo has come a huge, huge way since the days when I went as a child and saw these lions and tigers pacing up and down in a, a cage that wasn't the length of where I'm standing now. And I think Dublin Zoo have done a lot to try and bring in the natural habitat for these animals. Of course, nothing beats leaving them in their natural habitat, but I do think zoos have done very good work in preserving species that would have become extinct due to illegal poaching and, and that. And I think the zoos are also good in promoting animal welfare. And when they have school groups and youth groups there, I think the work that they are doing with them in building up an awareness of animals and animal welfare is very good. So there's positive and negative. A lot of positive, Minister, and I want to acknowledge that. But the, the essential elements of animal cruelty, and it is there in the ones that I have mentioned, they have to be addressed. And I know myself and others will be looking at these for amendments. Thank you. Thank you very much. I now call on...